He is more than a story. He is more than a comic book superhero. He is more than a symbol of hope. He represents our greatest aspirations. He is everything we think we can be. And yet, even with all the strength and all the power in all of the world, he may not be able to meet his greatest challenges and redeem his family's legacy. For he is the son of El. Chapter 17 Reformed Citizen After returning from the realm of the dead, Clark was especially quiet. He went through his day-to-day -day life slowly processing what he'd been through. There was work he had to catch up with at the Daily Planet, and he quietly put himself to it. All that week, Superman made few appearances, leaving most of the hero work to the rest of the Justice League. Jimmy was perched at Clark's desk on Friday morning, sharing his thoughts on a new camera, when Lois stormed in and threw her things down on her desk. Can you believe this? Where's the justice? Believe what? Clark hadn't seen Lois this riled up in a long time. Luther, he's up for parole. Already? Technically, it's a year early, but I'm surprised he hasn't wormed his sleazy way out already. Probably can't wait to send his goons after me. Lois sounded sarcastic, but the gravity of her situation panicked Jimmy. Ah, gee, Lois, aren't you worried? Not too worried. My luck saved me enough times. Luck? Is that your nickname for Superman? Ha ha, Olsen. Clark tuned all this banter out. Instead, he looked up all he could on Lex's case. Lois and Jimmy went to their respective desks, and Clark was buried in his own writing all morning until a small voice spoke to him. You don't have to do this. Clark looked up to see a frumpy little old man. It was Kurt, the shoeshiner from the Daily Planet's lobby. In the decade Clark had worked there, he had never seen Kurt out of the lobby before. Excuse me? You don't have to be doing this. It's okay. I know who you really are. You need to be out there saving people, Superman. This was not the first time someone remarked on Clark looking like Superman. Though the usual response was to marvel at their similarities. Anyone who spoke to him for more than a few minutes would not believe this large, awkward reporter could ever be Superman. There were several times people went as far as to try to hire him for birthday parties, to appear dressed in a cape and tights. Even if he didn't emit light and have wind blowing through his hair, he was often offered impersonation jobs. Clark always refused such offers, but this was the first time that anyone outright accused him of being Superman. Are you alright, Kurt? I'm not sure I'm following what you're talking about. Sure you do, Superman. You don't have to keep up this charade anymore. The world needs you too much for you to be here pretending like this. Hold on now. No, no, Superman. You're not fooling me. I've been in that lobby watching everyone come in and out for years. But you? You sometimes come in through the lobby multiple times in a day, without ever leaving. Hold up, Kurt. I've seen you busy shining shoes and not even notice me. You would be surprised what I notice out of the corners of my eyes. And besides, I've got slow days too. You aren't fooling me. I finally figured you out for sure. Superman has barely been seen this week. And you've been here working more regularly than you have in years. And that ain't right, Superman. You need to stop pretending to be this reporter character. But I am a reporter. I was worried you'd say this. But I'm not going to let you hide like this anymore. Kurt reached into his apron and pulled out a small handgun. Clark tried pleading with him. Hold on now. You don't want to do anything you're going to regret. I'm not going to regret anything, Superman. It's just a 22. Just be sure to catch the bullet so that it doesn't ricochet and hurt anyone. By this point, people in the office had noticed the drawn gun. Some had even overheard parts of Clark's conversation. Terrified anticipation filled the room. As Kurt pulled the trigger, releasing the gun's hammer, Clark's perception of time slowed to a near standstill. He watched as the bullet released from the barrel. In the nanoseconds it took to travel across his desk, Clark considered his options. If he dodged the bullet, he might be able to make it look as though Kurt missed. But the office was too crowded for that. 
Clark couldn't risk anyone else being shot. Should he catch it or deflect the bullet, he would be outed as Superman. His secret identity would be lost to him. If that happened, Clark Kent would essentially be dead. With no other choices left to him, Clark let the bullet penetrate his flesh and it lodged itself into his gut. It was not that different from the way he would allow his hair to be cut or how he shaved. Only, being shot was far more painful than a haircut. The searing pain it carved into him was like what he felt in the nether realm, only he couldn't pull himself away from it as he had been able to pull his hand from the darkness there. Horror overtook Kurt's wrinkled old face as he watched the blood slowly stain Clark's white shirt. No, Superman, no! Kurt dropped the gun and rushed to Clark, pleading with him. Don't do this. You can't be shot. You're Superman. You, you're gonna be fine. You'll see. You'll heal right up, right, Superman? Right? Right? But Clark ignored his pleas. He had to think quickly. By itself, being shot was not enough to keep his identity secret. While he lay on the ground, firmly holding his wound shut, he feigned defeat while reaching out with his mind to contact Jean Jones. Clark needed the Martian Manhunter's shape-shifting ability. Jean had to make an appearance as Superman, a public appearance with the Justice League, somewhere crowded where he would be seen. It needed to happen soon. While Clark was in the public eye, shot and bleeding, any suspicion that he was Superman needed to be put to rest. After the initial panic settled, Kurt was arrested and paramedics came for Clark. He let himself be taken to the hospital. Lois, especially, was in complete shock. Though not the same shock as the rest of her co-workers, his performance had fooled even her. While Clark let himself be operated on at the hospital and was held for observation, he missed his opportunity to speak at Lex Luthor's parole hearing. Lex was set free and immediately went on a press tour with a considerably warm welcome on all of the major networks. Clark could not fathom how this criminal was so beloved on every show he appeared on. While Lex became a media darling, Clark took time off of work to give the appearance that he was recovering from his gunshot wound. To escape the public eye, Clark went back to Smallville for a while. The moment he had left the hospital and taken his form as Superman, his wounds were healed as though they had never been there. On the farm, Clark was clearly needed. Odds and ends of equipment that Jonathan had around the property had to be dealt with. Martha wasn't the only one needing help. Lana's father, Hank, had been ill in recent years, and their farm had also fallen into disrepair. Though they were reluctant to ask, Clark kept offering to fix up their place just a bit at a time. Ever since getting married, Lana and Ted rarely visited, so Clark did all he could to help while he was around. His workdays were long and he took many breaks, attending to saving those in need around the world, especially in Metropolis. He made sure his presence was felt there. Kurt had been right about one thing. Superman was needed. While in Metropolis, Clark regularly checked on Lois, passing by her apartment to see that she was alright. One evening, he found her stargazing, and she caught his eye as he flew by. He decided it would be less awkward if he dropped down to say hello. Lois didn't wait a beat to start the conversation. I'm glad to see you're feeling better. I thought you couldn't be shot. I had to put on a good performance, you know, to keep my identity from being exposed. Cute. You really worried us. I'm sorry. I guess that was a part of it being convincing, too. So are you stalking me now? No, I just want to make sure you're alright. You know, with Lex Luthor out of prison and all. Well, I appreciate the concern, but I think he's too busy with his publicist to waste time on me. He was just on some stupid live talk show a moment ago. He even brought Metallo with him to join his circus. Corbin? But why would he want to bring him on a talk show? Oh, some sob story about what a victim of the system Metallo was? I was so angry, I was practically yelling at the screen. I came out here for some errand to cool down. But now I'm getting cold. Want to come inside? Where's Richard? Oh, it's conference season. He's touring the circuit. Come on in. I could use some company. I don't know. Oh, come on. We haven't talked in a while. Clark reluctantly agreed. Lois offered him a drink, but he declined. She poured one for herself, and they sat on the couch, discussing Lex. Clark wanted answers. But why the redemption tour? Maybe he's about to announce a book. Some kind of memoir. I'm just glad he's so desperate to appear nice. I mean, he wouldn't possibly go after me on his press tour, right? Her voice cracked with doubt. After her next drink, 
Lois was soon opening up about her fear of Luther. It was something she preferred not to admit. Appearing vulnerable was not her style. Just talking about it brought her to tears. Clark comforted Lois, wrapping his arms around her and holding her close. But I can say this to you, Superman. I feel safe with you. She looked up to him, their eyes only inches apart. On an impulse, she kissed him. He didn't resist her passionate embrace, but when the moment passed, he suggested he'd better go. He felt a pang of guilt for kissing her back. The guilt clung to him like a burr, especially as he continued to fly by Lois's apartment or by the Daily Planet to be sure Lex wasn't going after her. Though the more he checked on her, the more pointless it felt. Lex was focused on his public image, and for some strange reason, he was working on John Corbin's public image as well. Why was Corbin going on a press tour with Lex? Eventually, curiosity overcame him, and he watched the interview for himself. Compared to Corbin's previous cybernetic body, enhanced with speed and strength specifically to give Superman a thrashing, he had become a boxy shell rolling on wheels and fashioned with the most rudimentary of arms. The interview had framed around why Corbin had testified against Luther in court. He was now recanting that testimony. Corbin had changed his story, saying the Justice League had intimidated him into testifying. This wasn't at all how Clark remembered it. Back then, Corbin had been quite desperate to paint himself as a victim of Luther's. He had been poisoned by kryptonite dust while carving the chain that he later used to bind Superman. When he was dying from kryptonite poisoning, Lex offered to transplant Corbin's brain into a cybernetic body. While testifying, he said he felt like Luther's tool. But in his recent interviews with Lex, he was praising Luther for saving his life. It boggled Clark's mind. Superman chose not to dwell on it. His duties with the Justice League never relented for long. Military skirmishes in Eastern Europe were putting innocent lives at risk. It was the Justice League's policy to stay out of international disputes, though whenever their help was requested, they did all they could to save the innocent bystanders caught in the midst of modern warfare. Clark had been at the Hall of Justice when the call came in. A village in Kasnia was in the crossfire of a civil war. Clark didn't wait for the Javelin 17 to board and take off. Instead, he raced around the world to discover the village had already been torn to rubble. This was like no other war he had seen before. The usual drones that did battle were hardly present in comparison with the number of foot soldiers. They were distinct from other foot soldiers, moving as though their bodies were somehow enhanced. Their weapons were unusually advanced as well, shooting energy beams as ammunition. Both the Kasnian military and the rebels had this technology. No drones stood a chance against these trained armies. Usually when the Justice League intervened, it was to save innocent lives caught in the middle of warfare. Drone squadrons encountering each other at the wrong place and time would break into an attack on one another. They were a general danger to bystanders, but this village had been destroyed beyond recognition without the drones. Not a villager was in sight, but looking through the rubble with his supervision, Clark could see underneath. People were still alive, hiding in buried cellars. By the time the Javelin 17 arrived with the rest of the Justice League, Superman had already gotten most of the survivors out, but one of the two armies had converged on the village and was firing on him as he attempted to rescue the villagers. The Justice League took action, defending Superman as he continued to find and save everyone as only he could with his enhanced vision and super speed. The League roster that day was Superman, Mr. Terrific, The Atom, Black Canary, Black Lightning, and Dick Grayson, Batman's apprentice. Grayson had recently parted ways with his mentor, dropping his former moniker of Robin in favor of a more mature title. He called himself Nightwing. He and the other four were well matched by the encroaching army, but they were a honed team, with years of experience over their adversaries. By riding on one of Black Lightning's electric arcs, the Atom was able to infiltrate the soldiers' ranks and microscopically disassemble their weapons from the inside. Mr. Terrific and Nightwing disarmed and nullified foot soldiers, while Canary with her voice and Black Lightning with his electric blasts disabled the armored vehicles. With the Justice League's support, the villagers were successfully evacuated. But before the fight was over, a large cybernetic man, clearly of exceptional rank in the Kasnian military, faced off with Black Canary. He matched her strength and agility, forcing her to resort to using her powerful Canary cry. But the cybernetic soldier had the unusual ability to redirect her blast of sound back at her. Canary was thrown into the rubble surrounding them where she lay in a stunned heap. Nightwing was the first to reach her. He scooped her up and brought her out of harm's way. Before the rest of the team could mount their defense for a coming attack, the opposing rebel army, 
who had been at war with the military when they arrived, circled around and were ambushing their enemies from behind. The Justice League's fight ended all at once as Superman got the last of the villagers to safety. The battle was now centered around the two armies. It all seemed like pointless violence to Clark. He wanted to break up the fighting, but Mr. Terrific reminded him that these conflicts were not theirs to decide. Politics and foreign affairs are messy, and they were lucky Canary's blowback was their only casualty. As they flew back to the Hall of Justice aboard the Javelin 17, Clark checked in on her. Are you alright? That was quite the spill you took back there. No, oh, I'll be alright. I'm more shaken than hurt. Yeah? Yeah, I've never been hit by my own voice before. It was harsher than I expected. Oh, you don't really sound like that. It sounded like he added some distortion when he deflected your voice. Thanks. That actually helps to hear. But it's more than that. That cybernetic soldier back there? His powers totally negated my powers. He made me feel... incapable. Clark could relate. Those moments are the worst. When you're expected to be a hero, but suddenly you're powerless, and end up being the one needing to be saved? I wish it didn't happen to me so often. Canary looked at him in astonishment. You? Really? You've needed to be saved? Oh sure, plenty of times. It happens to the best of us. Apparently so. Ha ha, yeah, I've had my bad days too. Yeah, I noticed you weren't around much, and then Martian Manhunter started filling in for you. Are you okay? Oh, I'm going through all kinds of stuff these days. Do you maybe want to talk about it? I probably should. I'm listening. I've got nowhere to be until this plane lands. Thanks, Canary. Please, Kalel, call me Dinah. Clark shifted in his seat and looked up to her concerned smile. Thanks, Dinah. Now what's going on? There are a few things, actually. Canary assured him. I find it's better to just plunge right in. Clark took a deep breath before letting himself open up. Well, my pa passed away recently. Oh, sweetie. I'm so sorry. Thanks. It's been hard. Usually I'm able to save everyone. But there was nothing I could do for him. And well... I gotta say goodbye, but it would be nice to have my pa around, especially right now with all that's going on. What's going on that Superman can't handle? Lex Luthor, for starters. He's out of prison and on a press tour and I feel like there's something up his sleeve. I just wish I knew what he was up to. Oh, I imagine he just hired a publicist. It seems in character to me. Maybe, but he makes me nervous, as though something else is coming. What could Luthor possibly do? Especially with the public eye on him like this. It's just... That's just it. This isn't what I expected from him. Is it really that hard to believe? The guy is an egomaniac. What I can't believe is that viewers are eating it up. He's a complete phony, but they love it. Yeah, it's just weird. But... Is that it? Is that the thing you wanted to talk to your father about? No. It's more than that. I... I would usually talk to Batman about this stuff, but we haven't been speaking much lately. Really? What's going on there? Uh, it's complicated. But I don't think he wants me around, so I'm just keeping my distance. A third voice broke into the conversation. Nightwing had been listening. If it helps, I can tell you it's not personal. He has a contingency plan for dealing with everyone, even me. This news left Clark wide-eyed. Please tell me you're kidding. Look, I heard what happened. I don't think he would say it, but he really regrets how it went down. I think you really shook him. That doesn't happen to him too often. I hadn't thought about it that way. Trust me, I know him all too well. He's stubborn. You'll have to make the first move. But do it. Visit him. It'll be good for him to have some company. Thanks, Dick. Oh, uh, I'm going by Richard now. Oh, Changing both names, are we? Yeah, well, I'm on my own now. Making a name for myself. Being my own hero, you know? That's part of why I joined the Justice League. Did you really leave the manor? Alfred is still helping me get by where I need it. But I'm not there anymore. Are you in college? 
Well, yeah, that's mostly why I left home. I'm going to school in Starling City. Dinah jumped back into the conversation. That's where I went to school. Clark hoped his young friend was all right and kept inquiring. How's it going? All right, I guess. But I missed the hero's life. Batman told me it wouldn't look good if I moved across the country and Robin suddenly started making appearances in the same city. So I figured I'd reinvent myself, you know? Nightwing's blue and black was a stark contrast to the red, black, and green he had worn as Robin. What does Batman think? He's against it. At least, while I'm in college. But I don't have to do what he tells me anymore. So Nightwing it is. Good for you, Dinah enthusiastically assured Richard, though Clark was still concerned. Don't you think you should reach out to him too? You know, since he won't be the one to do it? What? No. I'm done with his games. No way. And you think I should visit him? Definitely. And you aren't just sending me there to mess with him? Well, mostly. But it would be good for him. And why's that? Well, for one, he's a horrible father. But he's not your father. So don't worry about that. He's not going to do anything to you. And number two, he needs people. And you're like his only friend. This perspective was indeed eye-opening for Clark. Huh. Now I feel like I've been a jerk. No, it's definitely him. I'm just asking you to give him another chance. But what about you? That's different. He's basically my dad, so I'm stuck with him. But you? You're someone he really respects. Clark needed to hear all this, but his sense of distrust still bothered him. Batman had too many secrets. The depth of these secrets was not something Clark wanted to breach out in the open, even aboard the Javelin 17. Regardless, there was no chance to discuss it any further. Their conversation abruptly ended when his communicator watch told him Lois was in trouble. In the blink of an eye, he left the Javelin 17 and was shooting faster than a speeding bullet towards Metropolis. A sniper had opened fire on Lois in her apartment. Luckily, she had bulletproof glass installed years ago. The reinforced glass gave her time to duck away to her bedroom and call for help. The first four bullets had strategically weakened the glass, and the fifth one broke through precisely at the moment Superman arrived. The sniper was dressed in a super suit, a red and white bodysuit with a giant red scope strapped over one eye. By the time Superman spotted the sniper, he had already launched some kind of small gas canister. The shot perfectly slipped through the hole he had carved in the window, and the would-be assassin immediately fled across the rooftops. In a panic, Clark burst through Lois's shattered window, removing part of the wall with it. The canister had lodged itself into the back wall facing the window and was spewing some foul gas into the room. To remove it, Clark ripped into the wall, taking a chunk of the plaster along with the canister. He quickly grabbed a large pot hanging in the kitchen and used it to cover the gas canister out on the patio. Clark raced back into the apartment, inhaling the gas into his lungs and blowing it all outside in one mighty breath. This was all the time the shooter needed to escape. Once he was sure it was safe, Clark found Lois hiding in her bedroom. Tears streamed down her face as she ran into his embrace. Clark held her as she wept. Somehow, she had never felt so afraid for her life before then. When she finished crying, she saw the state of her living room and nearly burst into tears again. Clark thought it better not to leave for a while, especially with the gaping hole in the window. Do you have somewhere else you can stay? Richard's out of town, but I have the keys to his apartment. Do you want a lift? Ooh, I have a hard time passing up flying. Can you carry a suitcase too? Hurry up and pack. Once they got to Richard's place, Lois offered to cook them dinner. This gave them time to talk over their shared anxiety about Lex Luthor. After dinner, Lois didn't want Superman to leave. He was also nervous to leave her on her own so soon. While browsing for a movie to watch, they found Lex was momentarily starting an unscheduled press conference. Though they were sick of him, they were compelled to watch. This conference had more fanfare and decorum than Lex's usual. A sinking sensation took hold of Clark. As Luther began speaking, a pit formed in his stomach. As he had feared, he was up to something big. Lex Luthor announced he would be running for president. In hindsight, this was so obviously Luthor's plan all along. Clark was glad he saved himself the embarrassment of asking Batman about it. Instead, he managed to learn what Lex was up to by simply waiting him out to reveal his plan. There really was nothing he could have done to predict it. Clark managed to convince himself that he didn't need Batman's help after all.
Thank you for listening. I'm Isaac Bluefoot. Sanabel is written and produced by myself. If you're enjoying this audiobook, please recommend it to friends and write a review. Help me spread the word about this amazing story. Another way to support the show is at patreon.com slash bluefoot. This story was inspired by the Superman and DC comics and characters originally created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. With additional contributions by Joseph Samichson, Joe Serta, Robert Bernstein, Al Plastino, John Ostrander, Tom Mandrake, Julius Schwartz, Gardner Fox, Gil Kane, Dennis O'Neill, Dick Dillon, Tony Isabella, Trevor Von Eden, Bill Finger, Bob Kane, David Vern Reed, and Lou Sayer Schwartz. Manuscript editing assistance by Trisha Reel. Music in this episode was made by Poddington Bear, Blue Dot Sessions, Vortex, Kai Engel, Nisei23, Will Bangs, Mellow C, Luxa Love, and Bio Unit. See the episode notes for details. For more of my work, get yourself a deck of Omen Quest cards at omenquestcards.com. Storytelling games for all ages. And be sure to listen to the next episode, Chapter 18, Vigilantes Among Us.